Hello, my brothers and sisters. I greet all of you in the name of our Heavenly Father, Yahuwah the Almighty. And I greet you all in the name of our King, the only begotten Son of our Heavenly Father, the eternal life of our Heavenly Father, Master Yahushua of Nazareth, through their precious spirit. And I hope that all of you are doing well, and again, that you all are continuing to grow into maturity. And that you all have taken the time to, again, reconsider. As I've been granted to continue our Father and our King's teachings dealing with doctrinal issues, of course. And this particular one is pertaining to, is the European fully human? And so now let us get down to this lovely discovery and this lovely journey that we all are going to go on. Let us commence in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, the 19th chapter. Thank you so much, my Father and my King, for your goodness and for who you are and for what you're going to do. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19. And this is to pertaining to a question that the Pharisees was asking our king, a particular question. So let's examine it. Let's start at verse one. And it reads, and it came to pass that when Yahushua had finished these sayings, he departed from Galileo. Or Galilee, and came into the coast of Yehuda, beyond Yarden. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. So let's focus on just how our master, what he was doing, the great work that he was doing through his heavenly father and his heavenly father through him how what he was doing caused much to follow him. Let's really focus on what happened. Verse 3. The Pharisees, of Ferushia, also came unto him, tempting him and saying to, unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every case? That's very interesting, my family. Notice the particular action of the Pharisees. They were coming for inquiry regarding our master. However, their intention was not truly to come to him, but to tempt him. And our king knew of these beautiful things. Do you see this? It was beautiful because he knew their intentions. And let's see how he deals with them. Verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore the Almighty have joined together, let not man put asunder. That's powerful. So what's so interesting about this, of course, they was asking him, trying to trap him up regarding divorce. But notice how our king took them right back to the beginning. And obviously, they were not really astute as they claimed they were. But our master regarded them to go back and ask, did they read these things? And so he acknowledged what happened in the beginning regarding man and woman. Now, let us go on a journey and see what happened in the beginning. Let's go back to Genesis, the first chapter. Thank you so much, 
my father, my king, for your wisdom. Let's go back to Genesis, the first chapter. And let's go to the 26th verse, and all of you should be familiar with this. So let's look at the 26th verse. And it says, as it reads, it says, And the Almighty said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So the Almighty created man in his own image. In the image of the Almighty created he him, male and female created he them. Now this is powerful. So we see the establishment of creation. Do you see this, my family? Let's continue. And the Almighty blessed them, and the Almighty said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So what's concrete is that our Heavenly Father gave man dominion over not just the earth, but over all things as far as the animals. Do you see this, my family? And we have to be able to really focus on this because this is the error that many of the arrogant scientists over time have missed. They went into our Heavenly Father and our King's word and they basically just butchered the scriptures and misunderstood them. And our Heavenly Father is teaching the body of the Messiah to be ready and reteaching us so that way we do not be lost. Listen, verse 29. And the Almighty said, Behold, I have given you every herb and bearing seed. You see this? Thank you, my Father, my King, for the correction. Listen again. It says, And the Almighty said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. All of you need to keep this in mind. Regarding what our father through his son, his eternal life, through the precious spirit, gave man as far as to what to consume. We have to be able to understand this before we go further. Because I want you to understand what the, uh, the scholars and as far as what the scientists of modern day and even of antiquity, what they have missed. Do you see this, my family? Listen, verse 30. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creep upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Do you see this? So now what our Heavenly Father through His Son is teaching all of us through the precious spirit is that notice how even the animals, wherein there was life, He also gave them the green herb for meat. This is very important. See, there were no carnivores during this time, as the scriptures state. During this time, humans were not eating animals, nor animals eating humans. Because our father, my king, gave both parties the herbs. Do you see this? The green herbs for meat. Do you understand, my family? Let's continue. And the Almighty saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. That's powerful. You see, it's my brothers and sisters. So now, what has been established by our Father, our King's wisdom, not my own, is to basically establish the fact that when he first created humans, as well as the animals, he did not create them to consume one another. Our Heavenly Father did not create mankind to eat the animals because we just read where he gave them dominion over them. There's no command where he said to eat the animals. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? And then we also see how our Heavenly Father laid down as far as the natural establishment that the animals were to eat the same thing that the humans were eating. The green herb for meat. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? 
Now, let's go to Genesis, the second chapter. But what we all need to really focus on is the proper context, because this is what caused a lot of confusion regarding the scientists when they went into the book of Bereshit or Barashayat, which we know as Genesis. Do you see this, my family? See, when the scientists went in here, they went in with an impure mind. They tried in their arrogance to basically decipher our Heavenly Father's word, but they did not come with the right heart. And this is why they've confused the masses. Now, let's look closely. Let's look at the first verse, Genesis chapter two. Let's focus on the first verse, please, to understand the context of chapter two and chapter three in its entirety. It says, thus or this, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. Do you see this? My thing. See, that's the first step. Thus or this, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. Look at verse two. And on the seventh day, the almighty ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And the Almighty blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which the Almighty created and made. See, if we don't understand the context, this is what causes much error and much misunderstanding. Look at verse four. Now it's going to give us the specific context. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that Master Yahweh the Almighty made the earth and the heavens. So now when you're continuing to read Genesis chapter two, what is expounding to all of us, if we can see it clearly, is now it's giving us details of how things were created in great detail because it tells us up here that everything was finished and all the hosts of them. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? Now, let's stay in chapter two and let's go to let's go to where our master Yahushua was expounding from. And let's look at Genesis, the second chapter, please. And let's focus on the 18th verse. Listen. And the master Yahuwah, the almighty said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him in help meet for him. Do you see this? So now our Heavenly Father through his son is acknowledging that things are not complete. Do you see this? Now look at verse 19. And out of the ground, the master Yahuwah, the Almighty, formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. Do you see how the man now is exercising his authority? Do you see this my brothers and sisters? Let's continue. Verse 20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help me for him. And the master Yahweh the Almighty caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the master Yahweh the Almighty had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Now, what's interesting because scientists have taught that there was these pre, uh, like a pre-Adamic race. But we're going to listen to what Adam identifies and see if there were others like him or if this is something that's unique that came out of him. Verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Notice how Adam did not identify any other that had bones like him or that had flesh like him. 
So this is a unique experience that he is identifying. You see this, my brothers and my sisters. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So when Master Yahushua was quoting from it, he was de uh, basically dealing with his enemies who was trying to trap him. He was dealing with them on a context pertaining to divorce. So even Master Yahushua acknowledged what? The first man and the first woman. He did not take them back to the beginning and reference from a different race of people who was walking around. Do you see this, my family? And again, understanding the context in Genesis chapter 2, the first through the fourth verse, will be able to really help us to identify and really have a clear understanding. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? Now let's go to Genesis, the third chapter, because we have to really look at something. Why? Because scientists are saying, still in their ignorance, what they're basically teaching and speaking doctrines of devils, they're basically telling the masses they're basically saying that we don't come, or as they would say, Europeans, they don't come from Adam and Hawa or Adam and Eve. Now, of course, all did not agree. And we're going to find out as I find a king deal with this issue for our edification. But you had those who basically negated the scriptures, even though they went into them to try to corrupt them. And they tried to point to a different or a pre-Adamic race. But the scriptures is going to really bear truth out in this particular matter. Because in order for civilization, according to their notion, for civilization to progress, they need to have a woman or a female counterpart. Correct? Now, let's look at something interesting and examine their logic to the scriptures. Now, let's go to Genesis, the third chapter, please. And let's focus on something interesting. This is after the sin account. Let's see what Adam says here. Genesis, the third chapter. Let's focus. Start at the 20th verse. And Adam called his wife's name. And it has Ewe or Eve, but it is Hawa. And Adam called his wife name, Hawa, because she was the mother of all living. That's powerful. Everybody needs to stop and really focus on this here. Even the scientists would have to close their mouth in their arrogance and humble themselves before my father and my king. Because if there are earlier civilizations or a pre-Adamic race that preceded my ancestors, then how, what other woman was the mother of all the living? There's no other woman according to the scriptures. So if we come from a pre-Adamic race or these entities as far as this, this uh, ape-like creature, then that negates the scriptures. Let's read it again. And Adam called his wife name, Ha'ua, because she was the mother of all living. That's powerful. Listen, verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the master Yahuwah the Almighty make coats of skins and clothe them. And the master Yahuwah the Almighty said, Behold the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Notice how Abba acknowledged that the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Do you see this? And according to scientists, what they say is that these, this pre-Adamic race, they had feelings and emotions. They understood things that had certain knowledge. Do you understand, my family? But our Heavenly Father is acknowledging Adam and Hawa. Let's read it again. And the Master Yahuwah the Almighty said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Master Yahuwah the Almighty sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. 
So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Edad, Karubayims, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Where were these other primates? Why weren't they trying to get past the Karubayim to get to the tree of life? That's very interesting. You see, it's my family. Now, before we, let's continue to go, before we really get into depth, we have to understand what the scholars were saying and what these scientists were saying. Back in the, around in the early 1800s, you had a gentleman by the name of Felipe Charles Sherman, and he lived from 1790 and he died 1836. This was the man who actually discovered the bones of what is known as the Neanderthal. Do you see this? He discovered him in basically in Belgium in 1829. Do you understand? Now, let's look at something interesting. We're going to go to the American College Dictionary, the American Heritage College Dictionary. And we're going to look at the definition of what is known as the Neanderthal, or it's pronounced Neanderthal as far as the TH being silent. Let's look at something very interesting. Thank you, my father, my king. And I'm on page 9, 10. And this source is the American, again, the American Heritage College Dictionary, the third edition. And it's from the Houghton Mifflin Company, Boston, New York. Now, let's look at this. I'm quoting on page 9, 10. And we're going to look up the word Neanderthal. And it's properly pronounced. And it says here, Neanderthal. One of its connotations or meanings says it means the Neanderthal man. There's also a slang connotation, and that means a crude or boorish person. And it says here, based on the adjective, it says of having to do with or resembling Neanderthal. In another connotation pertaining to it, an adjective, it's crude or bore or boorish. Do you see this? But what I want you to look at is, is this here. It says Neanderthal man, an extinct species or race of human beings, Homo neanderthalensis, living during the late Pleistocene. Do you see this? The late Pleistocene age in the old world and associated with middle paleo paleolithic tools. We're gonna to investigate that. Now it says here, now this is where the origin of the name come from. It says after Neanderthal Valley in West Germany. So the name Neanderthal actually comes from the, basically it comes from Germany. It was a, a Neanderthal Valley. It's actually named after that. This is where Basically, what they're saying is that these places, as the, far as the bones and fossil records were found by Mr. Felipe Charles Schmerling. I'm going to go to another dictionary, which is very interesting because this dictionary is what they teach in the school systems. And this here is the Intermediate Thorndike, uh, Thorndike Barnhart Dictionary. And it's from basically Scott Fortsman. So what I'm going to do is look up the word Neanderthal in here. Let's look at something very interesting. And I'm reading on page 582. Let's examine it, my family, and get an understanding. Neanderthal, of or belonging to a kind of prehistoric people who lived in caves in Europe, North Africa, and parts of Asia in the early Stone Age. Keep that in mind. One of these people, it says Neanderthals had large, heavy skulls, low foreheads, flat noses, heavy lower jaws, and large brains. That's powerful. So what we're looking at is we're seeing in the history books excuse me, as far as in the dictionaries, we're seeing how they're teaching these things 
and as far as what is being established in what we call today as modern day curriculum. So the Neanderthal is being taught today as far as in the modern day educational system. Do you see my brothers and sisters? So now what we need to do is let's go to one of our ancestors who lived long ago. His name is Matit Yahu, but as far as what he has been known by, his name is Matit or Yosef ben Matit Yahu. Yosef was his name, but he eventually had the name of Flavius Josephus, which was given to him. Do you see, my brothers and sisters? So, thank you, my father king, for the correction. So he he was born around, and those of you who want to go behind and make sure it's right, he was born around 37 CE or AD. He died in the first century around the age of 63 years old. So he actually wrote the antiquity of the Jews of the Yahudim. And his name was uh, Yosef or Yahusif ben Matit Yahu. Matit Yahu was his father. But he had the name given to him as Flavius, what we call today Flavius Josephus. So let's go into Flavius Josephus, please. I'm gonna be reading to you from Antiquity of the Jews. Let's prove all things. I'm gonna be reading to you from the Antiquity of the Jews, book one. Thank you so much, my father, my king. Book one, and the heading says, containing the interval of 3,833 years from the creation to the death of Isaac. I'm going to be reading from chapter one. So again, it's Antiquity of the Jews, book one, chapter one. And it says here, the constitution of the world and the disposition of the elements. And let's read here, please. And those of you who have Josephus, you can follow along. And it reads, Mo Moreover, Moses, after the seventh day was over, begins to talk philosophically. And concerning the formation of man, says thus, that God took dust from the ground and formed man and inserted in him a spirit and a soul. This man was called Adam, which in the Hebrew tongue signifies one that is red, because he was formed out of red earth, compound together, it says four of that kind is virgin in true earth. Now this is translated Thank you, my father, my king, for the question. That way you all will know. This was translated by a gentleman by the name of, as far as the source, the works, the complete works, the works of Josephus from Flavius Josephus was translated by William Winston. So that way you all can understand I quote the source properly. So let's go back here. So we see here that Josephus, which was a record keeper, he understood and he acknowledged that Adam he acknowledged the creation of Adam, how our father created him through his son. He acknowledged as far as what type of dust was he made from. It says here that he it says because he was formed out of red earth, compounded together for that kind is virgin and true earth. So that's very interesting. Now, let's continue to read. It says God also presented the living creatures when he had made them according to their kinds, both male and female, to Adam, who gave them those names by which they are still called. So Josephus acknowledges what was going on in Genesis chapter 2, as we know it. Let's continue. But when he saw that Adam had no female companion, no society, for there was no such created, and that he wondered at the other animals, which were male and female. He laid him asleep and took away one of his ribs, and out of it formed the woman, whereupon Adam knew her when she was brought to him, and acknowledged that she was made out of himself. Now a woman is called in the Hebrew tongue, Isa. But the name of this woman was, and it has Eve, 
which signifies the mother of all living. And we know in Hebrew it's Isha, but this is how it's translated. But notice what Josephus attests. He agrees that Eve, or Ha'ua, was the, was the mother of all the living. Do you understand, my brothers and sisters? So now what we need to do is let's go back into the scriptures and let's look at something. We're going to come back to Josephus, but let's look at something interesting. Let's go to Genesis, the 10th chapter. Let's go to what is known as the Table of Nations. And let's see, let's examine and see where the European comes from. Let's see. Genesis chapter 10. It says, now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were sons born after the flood. So we see Noah and our ancestors here. And notice how it says sons born after the flood. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? So everybody who's here goes back here. And Noah was a descendant of Adam. Verse 2. It says, the sons of Japheth, Gomar, and Magog, and Madai, and Yawan, and Tubal, and Meshech, and Tiras, and the sons of Gomar, Ashkenaz, and Rihat, and Togarma, and the sons of Yawan, Elisha, and Tarshish, Kitim, and Dodanim, by these were the owls of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families, in their nations. Do you see this, my brothers and sisters? So the scriptures bear record where the Europeans come from. Now let's go back to Josephus, our ancestor, Yosef ben Matiyahu. And let's go back to the antiquity of the Jews. And I'm going to be reading from 